Welcome to the Green Building Show, where we investigate green design and building trends throughout Australia. Welcome to the Green Building Show. This week, we wrap up our series on disaster design. I'll be sitting down with Gordon Beeth, the director of Cairns-based firm Edge Architecture, who's going to explain the fundamentals of designing and building for an extremely hot climate. And in this week's Australian style, we will bring you another remote marvel, and Light Homes' Mark Jones will bring us his hottest design blog. I'm here today with Gordon Beeth, Director of Edge Architecture based in Cairns in Northern Queensland. Thanks for being with us, Gordon. You're welcome, Carlos. Great. So today we're talking about building in an extremely hot environment, building for extreme heat. Can you paint the picture of what it's actually like to live in one of these environments? Well, it's, it's hot and humid, which means the body perspires. It's, it's a, a very different uh, climate to what you have here in Sydney, the temperate uh, climate. For instance, a couple of friends of mine arrived in Cairns uh, last week, some very prominent architects from Australia, and they were quite overwhelmed with the heat and the humidity uh, conditions of Cairns. So I was saying, how do you survive this? You know, <laughs> um, Which is interesting because you do get to understand and appreciate that climate in a different way. You move slightly differently. You, you, you move from shade to shade rather than spend time in the sun. So when it comes to the fund fundamentals of designing a, ha a home for, for this environment, can you give us a rundown what, what's the first thing someone should be doing? Should they be looking at the orientation of the, of the site? One should appreciate that probably the best comfort conditions you can get in the tropics is consistent with standing in the shade of a tree with the breeze passing. So when one is considering um, a, a house design, depending on its particular uh, contextual and geographical conditions, is to understand which direction the sun is going to come in, where it rises, where it is in the uh, midday, where it is in the hot afternoons. Um, second to that is the orientation relative to the wind. And again, depending on their particular geography and topography, um, that uh, breeze cannot be taken to be uh, are consistent with what might be registered at the airport in the wind uh, instruments, but there can be local deviations yep. to wind. Sun doesn't deviate, but the breeze does. Um, you can bend the wind, you can't bend the sun. So firstly, we organise to provide shade, shade from the sun. Um, but we have to also appreciate up there that the sun moves into the southern quarter um, in well, the southern hemisphere in mid summer, mm -hmm. which doesn't occur anywhere else in Australia. Okay, and, and what about materials, Gordon? Obviously lightweight is going to be the way to go, however, um, is, do you think there's going to be a, a necessity for any sort of uh, thermal mass or slab? Because the diurnal temperature range in the uh, hot humid climate is, is fairly small, it's 6 to 7 degrees typically of a daily temperature, so you're not going to get a great um, deal of relief once the sun goes down. You will get relief, it's the only time when obviously the temperature does drop, but nothing like in a temperature range or a more hot, um, a dry climate where the, where the temperatures can um, uh, reduce rapidly once the sun goes down. So that means in a humid climate there's no need for a thermal mass? It is, it is uh, typically we don't use thermal mass. Um, occasionally, depending again on its geographical context, there may be an appreciation of building into a hillside or close to a hillside mm -hmm. that will provide some degree of tempering of climate, but you would need a, a, a lot of mass and for many of the days of the year, it will not be effective as a temperature redu reducing. Okay, great. And, and you touched on wind earlier before, um, Gordon. Can you give us, um, provide our, our viewers with a, some practical tips in terms of um, cross ventilation? What, what can they do? Is, should they be picking up louvered windows? Should they be um, creating a more narrow um, house in the first place? What's yeah, definitely one of the, 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 the major constraints to airflow within a building are walls within the external perimeter of a building. Mm -hmm. If one can allow rooms to have two external walls so the breeze can enter and depart within that room without coming past a corridor. 
that is the best situation in terms of having breeze penetration with any particular room. Typically you want the air movement to be at the level of where the body is in the particular room. So in a living room, I mean, if you're standing or you're seating, you want the air to be at that level. Same at a bedroom, you want the air to be at the level of where you are in the bed. It's no use having high level windows within a bedroom and thinking that you're getting cross ventilation if in fact all it does is skim across the ceiling and doesn't pass your body. Okay. The, the critical thing with breeze penetration is that air passing across the skin creates a perception of coolth. So one metre per second of air movement across your skin creates a perception of 3.6 degrees centigrade reduction from the ambient temperature. Two metres per second, which is equivalent to standing underneath a fan, is about seven degrees difference in perception. And that perception is because the moisture is being taken away from the skin, mm -hmm. which is providing that degree of cool. Okay, so basically you're saying to keep, to keep cool in a, in a hot environment, cross ventilation is absolutely cross essential. Cross ventilation and ceiling fans, anything that's creating air movement is critical. All right, great. And what about the ventilation of the roof space? Look, uh, roof space is, is, can be uh, treated in a number of different ways. If I can speak more generally, we have a, a great ability to reduce temperature slightly once the sun goes down, if in fact, air, uh, if in fact temperature can move out of the building to the night sky. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if we insulate the roof heavily and the walls heavily, you do not get that ability to allow heat to go out except through openings and, and windows. So we have a bit of a, 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 a dilemma <laughs> in that it's great to insulate ceilings and roof space during the day. In the night time, you really want to dissipate that heat so you don't want that insulation. That, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a dilemma which is a very difficult one to, to overcome. Right. However, insulating from the day sun is more critical than releasing it. Okay, so insulation is still um, fundamental. That's correct. Even if you can't get rid of the heat in the air. That's correct. Mo most importantly is shade. So if you are having extended um, eaves, depending on the orientation of the building, mm -hmm. and keep sun off the walls of the building. So you insulate the roof, maintain the, the walls of the building in shade during the day is the best opportunity to maintain thermal comfort within the house. Okay, and would you advise a, um, a builder or a homeowner to elevate their house if they get the opportunity? Uh, depending on the uh, activities that are happening in and around the house, I've elevated buildings for the sake of ensuring that we get breeze flow into central courtyards or backyards rather than creating a wall which the air then on the outside has to move through. So that can be a combination of reasons why one would elevate a house. Um, it doesn't appear as though there's uh, any uh, particular benefit from having a slab on ground or a raised timber floor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but in their, again, in their contextual situations, where they are with regards to the geography of the land, one solution might be slightly better than another. Okay, great. And in your professional opinion, what's the first thing someone should be doing, or what's what's the if you if you had a choice to say key fundamental um, things to do to keep a house comfortable in, in a hot environment? What do you think that would be? Well, first of all, shade. Shade, yeah. Cover cover the cover the uh, internal spaces, but also try and cover the walls. Ensure large openings to the exterior of the building at the level of the activities within the rooms so that we can get breeze moving uninhibited right through that particular room. There are also obviously human emotional and spatial qualities that one would like within a house, whether it's a, a larger volume house or smaller volume, but also an appreciation of views and, and, and of course the wonderful topography that we have up there. So we, we can't lose out on the emotional side. Um, we can't prevent people from putting in media rooms which they want to have totally in, mm -hmm. <laughs> enclosed. Um, so there's a lot of uh, potential conflicts in building a home, but I think the parameters we discussed earlier will certainly give the basics of, of proceeding with a comfortable house. Fantastic. Gordon Beath, thank you for your time. Thank you, Carlos. Pleasure.
No top 10 design vlogs would be complete without the Cool Hunter. Cool Hunter is the pinnacle of everything cool in the blogging world. Um, he travels the world uh, photographing cool designs from everything from cars to house design. Uh, the founder, Bill Tikos, uh, stays ahead of trends and uh, doesn't get led by fads, and he actually creates them. The Cool Hunter has won a swag of awards uh, throughout Australia. Um, he also has 1.8 million unique visitors to his blog every month, and you can catch his blog at thecoolhunter.com.au. I'm here today with Kath Hall. She's the director of One Plus Two Architecture, based in Hobart. Thanks for being with us, Kath. Thank you. It's great okay. to be here. Good, good. So we're continuing with our Remote Wonders series, and we've found your house, Kath, which is called the Swansea House, which is also in Swansea, which is um, east of Hobart. Can you tell us how did this? What was the brief from the from the client? How did this project come about, Kath? Okay, this is quite an unusual brief because. Uh, it was a large client group. It was an extended family ranging from grandparents, their four children, and then their children. And it, the brief was for a holiday house for this extended family. And in fact, one of the um, children of the family was an architect themselves, but did not want to take on the project because they didn't want to work for their family, interestingly. <laughs> Okay, and it seems to use a bit of a combination of materials. Can you run us through the material selection? Yeah, I okay. have the materials were selected for their shack-like qualities. Uh, we didn't want to put a heavy masonry building or um, just a heavier building on the ground on that site. What we wanted to do was to reflect um, shack or holiday culture in Australia. So. What we looked at doing was putting in a combination of materials. The outside of the building essentially is a um, spotted gum exterior and then the internal reveals of that lining where you see them outside on verandas and so forth. Um, we've used uh, the Harbour Flex sheet. Okay, fantastic. And what about the sustainability aspects of the house? Does it? I mean, it's quite an unusual looking house. Does that... Does that um is that part of the solar, the passive design, sorry, or the thermal Yeah, color? it's definitely been designed for passive solar benefit. The house um, faces northeast, and it's, there's a lot of glazing on that northeast face. In Tasmania, the main problems are getting sun and getting out of the wind. So what we've given here are lots of options for being able to achieve that at different times of the day when the sea breeze comes up if it's windy in winter and those sort of options around the house. So we managed to do that by creating a number of different deck spaces on different sides of the house and then a courtyard at the back of the house. Okay, great. Well. And just looking at the photos here, Kath, there's one feature that really stands out in my eyes. It's almost like a, it's almost like a, a box-like feature coming out of one of the external walls with some glazing. Can you explain the purpose of that? Right, so what we've done is almost set up a bit of a false podium on the site to create this level area and the level courtyard mm -hmm. and then the accommodation boxes which are, I'll use the term loosely boxes mm -hmm. they uh, cantilever off that platform right. so they're really quite striking elements we've also then used a number of bay windows in the job which are, are really quite sharp and square um, and they actually create additional sleeping space. So we might say have a room that has a double bed in it, a queen size bed in it, and then we might have one of those pods on the outside of the building that uh, on the inside is another bed. All right, fantastic. Kath Hall, thank you for your time. Thanks very much. As Gordon Beath mentioned, insulation is crucial for building in a hot climate. But how do you compare all the different types of insulation out there? Well that's when you have to look at the R value, which measures the resistance to heat. The higher the R value, the higher the resistance. To find out some more information on this, I'd recommend visiting the Your Home Technical Manual website. It's got loads of information on finding the right insulation for your climate and for your home.